between the community, the healthcare system, government, and also just social service systems in general. So it's a very important role and one that I think is expanding. We're very honored today to have Margarita Hart with us from the Indiana Community Health Workers Association. She's um, the executive director of Esperanza Ministries there, and also Elizabeth Killian, who's the provider relations manager at the Indiana Medicaid, Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. So a couple of great resources on this particular topic. And first, we're just gonna have a few words from Joyce Fillenworth, the State Office of Rural Health. So Joyce, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Becky. Again, on behalf of the State Office of Rural Health, thank you all so much for the unbelievable commitment that's being required of you at this time. I just want to let you all know that we here at the state want to be able to support you and provide you guidance to the resources that you need. Um, just a couple of things I want to make sure that you're aware of. As Becky mentioned, we do have a call center open 24-7 um, that we're all working diligently at. Um, that phone number is posted in the chat. All you have to do for providers is hit option two and the general public post option one. So it's real simple and it is manned 24 seven to answer all your questions and provide you the guidance that you need. Also on our website, um, the Indiana State Department of Health website, isdh.in.gov that I can put in chat as well. Um, when you click on the COVID-19 banner, there is just a ton of information there for healthcare providers and the public even in um, PDF formats that you can print off and have for, as a resource for questions that you are receiving or are looking for guidance, even outside of healthcare, the public, um, your patients are coming in, have concerns about other resources, you can guide them there. There's just a ton of information. Um, the most recent message sent out was um, the outreach or um, clinical volunteers, perhaps those who have retired to see if there'd be an interest to come back and provide assistance. Um, Deanna Paddock at the state is our contact person to help answer those questions. And again, I will put her contact information um, in the chat as well. Um, I know you all get emails from me and just to let you know, I am trying to be as very selective on what I send to you being very, being respectful of your time that you have available, but I do just want to make sure that you receive the information, especially that that's coming out regarding the changes in Medicare, Medicaid payments, especially related to telehealth, communication resources, and so forth. And um, I'll put my contact information in the chat also, because if you have any questions at all, I'm not sure where to turn, please feel free to reach out to me. So again, thank you so much, and I'll turn it back over to Becky. Thank you, Joyce. And I know that we had several indicate that they were unable to join today. Certainly understand that. The session is being recorded, so feel free to share the recording link with um, everyone um, that you feel would benefit from the information in your organization. And also, I'll be sending out some of the links that Joyce had previously shared related to a social media toolkit and um, that includes uh, some sample news releases, radio scripts, infographics, publications, and some scripting for some patient calls just as a, an additional resource. So I'll send links out to those important resources that Joyce has provided. Um, as opposed to sending attachments, because sometimes a number of attachments will be blocked uh, in your uh, email system. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Margarita, and she is going to share the information by the Indiana Community Health Workers Association. Margarita? Yes, thank you, Becky. And thank you for having us here on uh, this important call to just share about community health workers and what their role is. So Indiana Community Health Workers is supporting the workforce of Indiana. And um, we were established um, several years ago. Um, it's a professional association 
And um, let's see, I'm having trouble. So our vision is to build healthy communities by advancing the community health workers profession through evidence-based strategies, education, and advocacy. So as an association, our role is to support the workforce of um, Indiana community health workers through a unified voice. So that means that we do a lot of policy uh, advocacy and we try to understand the different areas the state is so different all over the place um, just the work that the community health workers are doing out there there are a lot of community health workers that are employed by uh, health providers and some are employed by uh, social determinants of health um, areas so social services and there are many that are also volunteers so we we advocate for all of them so a CHW is defined by, we use the definition of American Public Health Association, and it is a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member of and or has an unusually close understanding of the community served. This trusting relationship enables the CHW to serve as a liaison link or intermediary between the health social services and health and social services in the community to facilitate and access services. So the key here being that the individual that is a community health worker is from that community. They either live there or have had the, the life experience of the community that they're serving. So they, they have a, a trust that is automatically built in because they have experience uh, the circumstances that their patients or clients are going through. The core roles of our community health worker is basically, um, there's 10 of them, but uh, this is a very brief description of, of what they are. Cultural mediation among individuals and the community and the healthcare systems and services. So understanding what the culture is, the culture of poverty, the culture of um, different ethnic groups, um, all of those uh, are included in this cultural mediation as they relate to uh, going to and getting services from the health uh, area or from social services. Uh, they provide a lot of coaching and social support um, for them, for our clients to st stay healthy or choose healthier habits. They provide culturally appropriate health education and information. A lot of times we have to tweak things to, to really be appropriate for ethnic group or for the culture that we're dealing with. Care coordination, case management, and system navigation is huge. We, we are not just encouragers, but we also are, are trying to coordinate the care that these patients are trying to reach. And that may include um, accessing pharmacy, accessing their doctor, accessing food, um, and definitely the services that are prescribed. We provide direct services. Um, so we do go to the homes, we visit our patients, we'll, we work in clinics, um, we, we work in different places where people are found. We, and home can be a, a shelter, it could be their, their own home. We build individual and community capacity. Um, we do that by growing uh, the number of people that can be connected and connect, connecting the dots certainly for some um, success in their, in their care plans. We advocate for the individuals in the communities. We're doing an awful lot of that, um, especially as things change or um, in, in the middle of COVID, we're, we're doing a lot of advocacy with um, the, the different landlords and trying to help our communities understand what their where their position their position is when they're unemployed. Implementing individual and community assessments. We do a lot of that to try to understand what does our community really need. So we do that through community health workers, just trying to find understand where are the gaps. We conduct a lot of outreach. We are trying to inform people of the many opportunities for help and we participate on evaluation and research projects as uh, some different agencies 
uh, use our services that way. So the thing with Indiana, and it's all over, is, is nationally, the issue has been what are community health workers really called? And right now, these are the common titles. Um, so the work of the community health worker can be um, kind of cloaked into a family education coordinator, or a health agent, uh, this, these different titles. But the core uh, things that I mentioned earlier are, is what they're doing. So that's, that's what's interesting, and it's at the same time very hard because then it's hard to identify who are these community health workers because they're known by all these titles. So who is empl employing community health workers? Right now in our database, we have 350 certified community health workers. And as of 2020, 50% uh, of these community health workers are employed by a health organization and IU Health, Parkview Health, Community Health Network, or Eskenazi just are the top employers of the community health workers. Uh, there are community-based organizations, 25% of them work with those, and 25% work with other agencies or even volunteer or some churches. CHWs in the field uh, are primarily doing these kinds of outreach and these kinds of work. Uh, their primary work, uh, the, the ones, the top, these are the top three. They worked in access to care, diabetes, pregnancy, prenatal, mental health, and lead poisoning. And here you can see um, that there's other groups of people working in housing. The secondary is housing and infant health. And they're also working in diabetes and community building and access to care. So why CHWs? It, it has been proven nationally uh, that there is, an there is a return on the investment. For every dollar that uh, an, a uh, health work agency or a social agency, for every dollar they invest, they will have three to $15 return. And this happens through peer support, reduction on hospital readmission, improving care transitions, uh, advancing that self-management and increasing appropriate access to care. They enhance the patient satisfaction simply because the patient understands what their care plan is and they also um, free up the professionals for more patient interaction. There is a certification in the state of Indiana. INCHWA is a certifying body for, uh, for Indiana under the authorization of the ISDH. The certification means that an individual has demonstrated a foundational mastery of these core competencies as defined both nationally and uh, in the state of Indiana through the completion of the training. Um, training and the testing delivered uh, is, is done by a training vendor that has been approved by INTWA. Certification means that the services as a CHW could be reimbursable by Medicaid services and are carried out as defined by uh, the Indiana Health Coverage Programs. And that concludes the short uh, presentation. If you have any questions, uh, Becky, I'll pass it on back to you. I did receive one question uh, through the email. Is there an advanced training right now to uh, for COVID-19 and a community health worker? Right now, uh, we are putting out information to the members on how to deal with some COVID-19. And one of the things that we're doing is putting it in various languages. So a lot of the things that we're doing is putting the information that the ISDH or the CDC has published in your site and the ISDH site and the CDC site and making sure that it's in smaller chunks so that the CHW can, can disperse that. And also we are translating as much as we can into Spanish because we know that a lot of, there's a large population. We're working on some of the Burmese languages, but we do have um, a way that we are uh, specialty training our community health workers through that. Great, thank you, thank you. Again, uh, any questions you have, you can email those to me or you can, we, uh, 
have chat available that if you have something specific or even if you have a comment that you would like to share uh, with the way maybe you are incorporating the community health worker at your hospital, we appreciate that too. So we'll switch over now to Elizabeth. And so Elizabeth can share her screen. Absolutely. Let's see. Um, Hover at the bottom. Uh-huh. That's okay. Hover at the bottom and see the green box with the arrow. Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then you'll have to select which screen you want to share and then click share. Perfect. There you go. Okay. Thank you. All right. So good morning. As um, they mentioned, I am Elizabeth Killian. I am one of the provider relations managers um, at the Office of Medicaid Policy and Planning. And oh, I can't move that over there. Sorry, I, it's covering up on my notes that I put in my <laughs> on my other screen. Um, if you're not familiar with our team, um, we are there to provide providers um, or to help providers navigate the Medicaid program and assist with any questions or issues they have with the fee-for-service or managed care programs. And that is generally speaking, obviously not just specific to um, uh, the community health workers. Um, so I'll be explaining a bit more about Indiana Health Coverage Programs, Community Health Workers Program, specifically the types of services community health workers are able to bill and the number of claims billed for these services um, since the beginning of the program. Um, so I also have the definition of what a community health worker is, um, although we just saw that it's the exact same definition that Margarita used, so I won't read that to you. Um, however, a, um, a community health worker does also build individual and community capacity by increasing health knowledge and self-sufficiency through a range of activities such as outreach, community education, informal counseling, social support, and advocacy. Um, so we look when we look at where the community health worker falls in the cross section of the population assisting members, we can see that the community health worker is at the intersection of community supports and the healthcare system. They help our members receive services that fall in both genres and help bring a complete approach to care for the members. A billing IHCP provider must maintain documentation of community health worker qualification for the individual providing community health worker services. Currently, IHCP will recognize any community health worker certification program that demonstrates the core competencies of a community health worker. Certification recognition may include individuals who have an academic degree, at least in associates, in a healthcare related field or employer-based training around health promotion and community health integration that provides training in community health worker competencies. Um, the IHCP will cover the following community health worker services. Diagnosis-related patient education for members regarding self-managing physical or mental health in conjunction with the healthcare team. This service allows a community health worker to extend education efforts associated with any physical or mental health concern that a member may encounter. Facilitation of cultural brokering between a member and the member's healthcare team. This service allows a community health worker to act as a facilitator between a Medicaid member and a provider when cultural factors such as language or socioeconomic status become a barrier to properly understanding treatment options or treatment plans health promotion education to a member on behalf of the healthcare team to prevent chronic illness. This service allows a community health worker to um, discuss and promote community, to, I'm sorry, to promote healthy behaviors with a member to increase awareness and avoid the development of chronic illnesses. Direct preventative services or services aimed at slowing the progression of chronic diseases. And some additional reimbursal functions can be seen on the screen as well. Um, this slide provides some real life examples of services that are reimbursable via the reimbursable functions. I know it can be difficult to interpret the definitions of the reimbursable functions into the real services provided by a community health worker. So services similar to these fall into the reimbursable functions. A doula teaching breathing and relaxation skills during pregnancy or delivery. 
diabetes educator providing information to patient on ways to prevent type 2 diabetes. Social worker providing educational support or information to a patient with a mental health diagnosis. Interpreter communicating and facilitating between patient and provider. Community liaison facilitating between patient and provider to help understand cancer treatment options. A health educator discuss, discussing tap, tobacco cessation with a patient. Lactation consultant providing education to breastfeeding to a breastfeeding mother. Health coach helping a patient understand their high blood pressure diagnosis and developing strategies to improve their blood pressure. Um, while community health workers are able to provide a great amount of services to Medicaid members and assist them in accessing the best care, there are some services and activities that are not reimbursable. Um, and I noticed that Margarita's presentation actually mentioned case management and core care coordination as reimbursable functions. So we may need to discuss offline what both what we consider those definitions to mean and what you all consider those to mean, so that there are not um, you know crossed wires here. Um, but from the information I already see from our policy team, um, case management and core coordination, care coordination, insurance enrollment and navigator assistance advocacy efforts, arranging transportation or transport, transporting a member to and from services, direct patient care outside of the level of training and certification an individual has attained. So the big distinction to keep in mind is that community health workers are not the same as case managers. A case manager can provide services on behalf of the member, while a community health workers provide services to the member. So I think that's the big distinction and um, particularly in the case of case management or care coordination, that could be a little fuzzy as to when it's on behalf of the member or to the member. Um, so I guess that's the distinction to keep in mind. So with that in mind, here are some examples of services that are not reimbursable. And note that on each example, the provider is performing a service instead of the member performing that specific action rather than providing a service to the member. So again, we want to make sure that that's the distinction, um, whether it's being done for the member or in lieu of the member doing that action, um, or if there is care being provided to the member. A community health worker must be supervised by a physician, a health services provider in psych psychology, advanced practice nurse, physician assistant, podiatrist, or a chiropractor. So I'm not going to read through each one of these bullet points, um, but all of the billing guidance can be found in Bulletin 2018-26, and I'm going to review how to access those bulletins in just a couple slides if you are not receiving those via your email or if you need to go back and find them. Um, some of the most important points are that billing providers should use procedure codes 98960, 98961, or 98962, depending on the number of members that are included in the education and training session, which range from one to eight members in one session. Um, note that during the COVID-19 public health emergency, services do not need to be provided face-to-face -face as is normally required. Um, currently, you can bill the normal procedure codes, so the 989-606162, um, with the GT modifier that the service was performed tel via telemedicine. Um, all billing guidance about telemedicine related to both community health workers and any other provider types um, during the public health emergency can be found in BT, which is Bulletin 2020-22. Again, more information on those at the end. Um, so back to some other of the normal billing details for community health workers. Covered services are limited to four units or two hours per day per member. Services are also limited to 24 units or 12 hours per month per member. Prior authorization is not required and each date of service must be billed on a separate claim line on a CMS 1500 or its electronic equivalent. Again, check out BT 2018-26 for all the details on billing. Um, so I'm going to switch now to reviewing some information regarding the number of claims that have been submitted since July 1st, 2018, which is when the program started. This chart breaks down the number of claims paid and denied each month since July 2018 for all the coverage programs, including Fee for Service, Who's Your HealthWise, Who's Your Care Connect, and HIP. 
The most popular code has definitely been the 98960, which is the individual sessions. Um, there have been a total of 9,015 claims paid under this code. The majority of the claims were for HIP members with Hoosier Healthwise members slightly lower than HIP. Um, we did see several denials, which you'll see on the right side of the screen, um, at the, for fee-for-service members specifically at the beginning, but there was a known issue with denials. Um, things that should have been paid were denied um, for most of the first year, which has now been fixed, and all of those claims that were incorrectly denied have now been paid. Um, so we have seen over $164,000 reimbursed for this pre procedure code since July 2018. Um, the procedure code for groups of two to four has seen significantly lower submitted claims and reimbursement rates. We've seen just over 200 claims paid for HIP members with just over $1,500 reimbursed. And then the sessions for groups between five and eight are even less popular. Um, only 73 total claims have been paid and approximately $350 reimbursed to providers. So we're, as you can see with that, the individual sessions are definitely the most popular way to provide these services. Um, so I'd like to just take a couple minutes to tell you about resources that we have available for all provider types, including community health workers and their supervising um, providers in ways that you can reach OMPP when you have questions. Um, so when you have questions or concerns, you can first reach out to your regional field consultants each MCE and DXC or fiscal agent has consultants assigned to each area of the state. They should be one of your first points of contact when you have questions. And our provider reference materials, which includes those banners and bulletins, can be found on the IHC pre IHCP provider website. If you're not familiar with that um, website, I did put it in the chat at the beginning and also, well, you're gonna see it on the next screen, but specifically how to sign up for those banners and bulletins to come to your email if you have not um, been receiving those. Um, and then the, the provider education that would include our um, banners and bulletins. These three things will keep you up to date with all of the new information coming from IHCP. The provider ed education tab on the provider website includes information on all the different trainings, webinars, seminars, and other education opportunities available to you. Um, normally, when we don't have a global pandemic, um, the IHCP provider relations team travels throughout the state in April and May to provide um, a training seminar um, through, we're going to go to 11 different cities um, in between mid-April and mid-May. Um, that is no longer happening this year, um, but we are going to be providing those, those presentations um, virtually. We're recording those, I believe, next week, so they'll be online for you. And then we also have, if you're not familiar, a fall seminar, which is three days long, held in Indianapolis in October. Um, hopefully, we will be holding that this year. Obviously, more to come. Um, but keep an eye out for those types of things as well, and you can see all those different opportunities um, on the provider education tab on the provider website. Um, so this is where you sign up if you are not receiving the weekly emails with the, um, with the banners and bulletins. Um, if you go to the provider website and scroll to the bottom, just like I said in the chat, you'll see a box just like this. Um, you enter your email address and you'll be signed up to receive our press releases and emails introducing that week's banners and bulletins. Banners and bulletins go out each week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so you, that information will be delivered straight to you with a um, link and um, a brief description as to the content of the banner or bulletin. Um, so you can go read those um, that pertain to you. They, unfortunately they're not, when you sign up for the email, it's not um, provider type specific. So you will get an email indicating all of the different um, banners or bulletins, but you can easily see if it's something that pertains to you and then visit that website or not. Um, and then once you're there, there is a way to filter um, the whole catalog of banners and bulletins so that you can reference back to those if you don't save the link or print it out or something like that. Um, if you have reached out to your customer service teams and the regional field reps for the MCEs and DXC and continue to have questions, you're always welcome to reach out to the provider relations team with OMPP. I am one of three provider relations managers and we are available to you all the time. Um, you can reach us via the OMPP provider relations email on the screen, 
which is OMPP Provider Relations at fssa.in.gov. And then the IHCP Listens inbox is another way that you can reach out to us. This inbox is specifically for us to receive feedback on our presentations and other outreach that we have done and to let us know if there, are, if there is a void in the information that we are giving to the provider community. I think of the two email inboxes this way. Um, if the answer to your question is specific to you or your facility, email the provider relations inbox. So that's if you have a claim question or anything like that. If the answer to your question would benefit the entire provider community or everyone in your provider specialty, send those questions to the IHCP Listens inbox. And there is no wrong door, as we say, so if you send it to the IHCP Listens, we will definitely still respond if it's more of a claim-specific question, but that's just kind of our method of trying to um, keep the content in separate areas. Um, finally, here are some additional resources specific to community health workers. Um, with the APHA link there. Um, also linked directly the bulletin that introduced the Community Health Workers Program and includes all of that detailed billing guidance. And then the um, provider website is linked there that I mentioned earlier. That's where you can sign up to receive those banners and bulletins if you're not yet receiving those. And then of course, my email address if you have any specific questions after the present presentation. And you can of course email me directly as well if you have any questions. Um, I obviously only man my own inbox, whereas the provider relations inbox is manned by all of the provider relations managers. Um, and are there any questions I can answer? Elizabeth, I did have one question that came to me. Can you describe a situation where a community health worker could be used to follow up with patients that had been seen in the emergency department as potential um, COVID positive patients and discharged? I think they're wondering about um, follow up as um, a call to the patient um, just to see how they are both mentally and physically. So is, uh, is the question generally, is that um, a reimbursable function? Yes, or how would you make it a reimbursable function, kind of describe sure. the, just the uh, case workers? Sure. Um, I would think that um, if you're providing information as to um, you know, access to additional materials or ensuring that they have, that they understand their discharge paperwork um, or any follow-up guidance from the, um, from the emergency department or the hospital where they, where they were, um, that can definitely be considered a reimbursable function. Um, just ensuring, and then again, as you said, if they're, if they have any questions as to just how they're mentally, excuse me, mentally recovering from that experience, um, helping them to, you know, provide information about any um, mental health services that are um, provide are, are available to them, then that could be a um, reimbursable function as well. Um, I think that generally, I would think you wouldn't have to stretch too far to make that connection, um, just because this is obviously a very difficult situation for everybody and nobody knows how to deal with this. So if you're provide if the community health worker is providing any sort of context of how to um, physically or mentally understand what they've gone through and providing additional materials or guidance on how to fully recover, um, that would be a reimbursable function. Okay, thank you. No the next question is, how can a community health worker be involved in uh, the screening process? And I think they mean from a re and be reimbursed at the same time. That wasn't included, but if you could address that too. That one is probably going to be a little bit more tricky just because um, I don't know, I'm not familiar. I know that the test itself is covered um, for Medicaid members, but if there, again, obviously if there's any interpretation needed or if there is, um, once results are provided, if they need help understanding, um, again, guidance from the, um, the emergency department or whoever is providing that test, that could be reimbursable. Um, 
I might have to take that question back and um, get some policy clarification on it just because I don't every there's kind of generally a lack of information about testing and screening right now so I don't want to speak out of turn on that okay that's fair that's fair um, and then we might go ahead and just take a little bit of time to discuss I know we it was shared at the very beginning of the call, you had been addressing several telemedicine uh, questions. So if you maybe yes. want to share information about that. Sure. So generally speaking, our telemedicine policy right now, and I briefly mentioned it, is that any service that does not um, logistically require a face-to-face -face interaction between the provider and the member is currently allowed to be billable via telemedicine and so what does that mean so obviously any surgical procedures are not billable via telemedicine laboratory procedures radiological procedures audiological services um, and chiropractic ser chiropractic services um, all of those obviously literally require the provider to be most likely touch the member. Um, we're obviously not providing surgery at home at the, during this time. Um, we're not taking x-rays via, you know, virtually. Um, so any of those types of services are excluded from our current telemedicine um, policy. But other than that, all services can be provided via telemedicine. Um, some, med some procedure codes are already on our telemedicine code set and if that is the case then you can bill those just as you would for any other like during any other time if there is not a current telemedicine code for the service that you're providing then you, you then you just bill the normal procedure code that you've always billed and if possible add the gt modifier which is just our tracking um, system for determining if um, if, a med if a service was provided via telemedicine. As I'm sure providers are aware, there's only space for four modifiers on a claim. So if you are already including four modifiers um, on, your, on your claim, then you do not have, it's not required to add the GT modifier. It's not gonna deny based on not including that. Um, but if you don't have the space to add the GT modifier, then please in your own records, just keep track of the, um, of the fact that it was that it was performed via telemedicine, um, most services can be provided via either um, both audio and visual, such as via Zoom call, FaceTime. Oh, and we're also re removing the requirement of a HIPAA compliant. Um, platform right now. So if you have to use FaceTime or any of those types of other, I don't know, Skype, anything like that, that is fine during this time as well. Um, the, there is a, um, the governor issued an executive order just yesterday that excludes physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy from the ability to have audio only. Um, so those must be performed via um, a audio and visual platform. Any other services can be performed through audio only, and whether that's just like a telephone call or um, any other um, any other platform. Um, there is some information as to place of service um, regarding telemedicine that I'm going to be honest, I have not been working on directly, so I'm not incredibly familiar with it. However, as I mentioned, that bulletin 202022 is, um, explains all of that in detail. MPP, OMPP did a webinar specifically on telemedicine, not this past Friday, but a week before. And so if you go to the provider website and go to the provider education tab, and then click on IHCP Live, then that will have a link to that webinar as well. Um, so you can see all of those, um, see that webinar. I'm actually going to see if I can show you guys, pardon me while you look at my entire screen. Um, but I just wanted, since it sounds like some people are not very familiar with the provider website, um, so this is, the home page here 
And if you go to the provider references, and the this is the banners and bulletins, most of the information is going to be under a bulletin. The, the difference between a banner and bulletin is really insignificant, um, but they are, but just know that there are two different ways to see information. So then this is going to be all of the banners and or all of the, the bulletins that we have released pretty much ever. Um, you can search, but it's actually kind of difficult to search, although if you have the bulletin number, you can search by that. Um, but here, BT 2020-22, this has all of the information that, about the telemedicine policy that we're currently using. So I highly recommend reading through that. Um, and then provider education and the IHCP live here. This will, um, um, the, the telemedicine one here is going to have the information about, it's just, it's a more of a verbal and um, verbal communication regarding telemedicine. There's not too much different information, except it does include some of the questions that we received. And then hopefully Thursday this week, there will be another bulletin that comes out specifically with telemedicine frequently asked questions. We are making the last minute changes to that right now, um, and that should be published on Thursday. Um, there's also bulletins through the process coming out about prior authorization changes um, during the public health emergency, and then um, timely filing as well, although I'm not certain where that one is, the, is in the process. I think that the prior, prior authorization one will be coming out on either today or Thursday as well, um, but definitely this week. Timely filing might be a little bit down the road next Tuesday or Thursday. They always come out on Tuesdays or Thursdays. So that was a lot of information. So then, <laughs> yeah, so just to make sure, if an individual wanted to access the current telemedicine policy, would they go to the link that you have here uh, that you're showing on the, the Zoom right now where it says, yes, is that where you would go to? So this is a recorded webinar, but yes, you can definitely mm -hmm. go to that. Um, if you want a more like written thing, then you will go to the bulletins. I don't know why there's two links. <laughs> um, and then uh, BT 2022, 2022. Okay. Okay. All right. So that has so definitely one has the more, you know, written out every all of the bits and pieces. Okay. That is all of the questions that I have received. Definitely, if you have questions after the call today, reach out and I'll facilitate with Elizabeth or Margarita to provide the answer. Um, wanna thank everyone for joining. Uh, just also want to remind everyone um, that also a good resource uh, for implementation is Becky Sanders at the Indiana Rural Health Association. So if you have questions regarding implementation, let me know and I will connect you with Becky as well. So um, at this time, I think we will close. We wanna thank our presenters for today and do want to encourage everyone to be very careful and safe and just wishing everyone well. So thank you so much and uh, take care. Bye-bye.